Today's episode of The Overwhelmed Brain is brought to you by GetOutOfTheMess.com. Connect with a law firm in your state or province so that you can get the answers you need without paying the exorbitant attorney fees. Call Asha, an independent associate for Legal Shield, at 678-355-8777. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old, rehashed personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to, think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. My name is Paul Coliani. I am a personal empowerment coach and this is where I help you tackle life's toughest challenges. I want to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. All right, what I want to talk about today is uh, the plight of the commitment phobe, the idea of commitment phobia, where you are afraid to commit to something because of fill in the blank. We're going to fill in those blanks today, but um, you know, I, I used to be this way. There was a time when I was searching for work and I would look through the ads and I would think, okay, well, maybe I can get that job. And instead of calling to find out more about it, the commitment phobia kicked in and I decided not to call. I decided that, uh, well, maybe if I got that job, it wouldn't be something I liked and maybe I wouldn't like the drive and maybe this. I came up with a lot of excuses to not take any action, to not make any call so that the job would just pass me by. So I would always set myself up to be on the side of caution instead of jumping into it uh, and hoping that it wouldn't fail. I just chose to take failure out of the equation by setting myself up to never commit to that, to, to a job. Now, it wasn't like that my whole life. I mean, I eventually jumped into work and if it sounded good enough, I would try it and everything would be great. But there are people out there that uh, choose not to commit to anything or when they commit to something now they feel like feel like they're stuck in it so they can't really have a satisfying time doing it so they live in fear so they live uh, feeling like they can't do anything now they have no options and um, somebody wrote to me and I'm going to read you the email shortly regarding this but um, you know it's funny a little side story actually it's scary (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because there is, you know, I'm talking about commitment phobia. I'm dealing with a phobia myself right now. In fact, when I first created the patron program, I think the second episode, I talk about that phobia. And uh, it's very personal. I, I talk about it to the people who are in the patron program, but I don't talk about it on the air. But it has to do with uh, some medical procedures that I'm having done right now. And I'm afraid. I'm, I'm actually fearing these procedures and I don't want to go through with them yet at the same time I know I have to so phobias in general are those things that we are afraid to do or be around if you're uh, if you're phobic of spiders you don't want to be near them there are people that will see a spider on the wall and leave their house for the night and go get a hotel room my phobia is not so bad like that but there are people that deal with phobias like that. So the reason I bring that up is because, you know, I want to share that little thing, what I'm going through now. There's stuff that I'm dealing with that uh, create a phobic response, which I would label as PTSD, which is fear of something because of something that uh, caused stress or trauma when I was younger. And this often accompanies any type of phobia. Something that happened to you when you were younger created a phobia. If you are phobic of dentists, something that happened to you when you were younger probably created that phobia. And it doesn't necessarily mean 
it happened to you. It could have happened to your mom, and she gave you nightmare stories of going to the dentist. And ever since then, you've been phobic about it. And uh, phobic's not always the right word, but I'm going to use that word sort of as a general word for um, what I'm talking about today. But um, yeah, you can fear spiders and never have had a spider incident. But because people around you feared spiders, you develop that learned response. And when you bring that response into your life, into the adult world, suddenly you are carrying around something that may not be productive to your life. It may not be beneficial. And how is it hindering you in life? For example, commitment phobia, if you're dealing with that, uh, how is that hindering you? What commitments have you chosen not to have in your life because you're afraid of commitment? And what opportunities are passing you by? Just like my phobia, you know, if I don't take care of this, which I am working on, but if I don't take care of this, then I will not be able to get the correct, you know, medical diagnoses or uh, medical procedures or whatever needs to happen in order for me to feel assured that uh, I'm not going to have some sort of weird condition or deadly condition, even disease. So I have to be very diligent in getting this resolved. And I am taking big steps to do that. And I share that with you because I want you to take big steps toward what you are phobic about, if it's preventing you from living a happy, satisfying, fulfilling life. I mean, if you're phobic of jumping out of airplanes, that doesn't mean you have to you know, address that phobia. It just means that if for some reason you have the opportunity to jump out of an airplane or you have to, it might behoove you to address it. It might behoove you to get that taken care of. And, um, you know, a lot of phobias are psychological, but some are also physical. I mean, they're all psychological. I shouldn't say it that way. They're all psychological, but they're, they can also be physical, meaning abuse victims will feel that, especially sexual abuse, where they are touched in a certain way and they have a physical response. And it's usually brought on by the psychological PTSD, the recollection, um, or even the kinesthetic recollection where the body remembers, but the mind doesn't. And that can get hairy when we talk about it. But the idea that you can be touched somewhere, that someone else touched you in a bad way, and you recoil, you have a physical response to it. And again, it does involve a psychological aspect to it as well. But I don't want to limit it and just say, hey, you have psychological issues, go get those taken care of. Because sometimes you can have it done physically as well. I mean, there are modalities out there, even like massage, that can help work out physical trauma from the past. It gets a little deep for what I talk about, and I don't know all the details, but let's just say this. I remember when I was married, uh, my wife massaged an area of my stomach. I don't know how she did it or what she did, but suddenly I started crying for no reason. Uh, well, for a reason, but something happened and I just started crying. And she goes, oh, we got something there. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? What is that about? And, you know, she, I think, explained it as stored trauma, repressed emotions. I don't know what it was. And, you know, I wasn't there to label it, but I certainly felt better afterward. You know, a good cry can make you feel better. A good one. <laughs> Sometimes we don't always feel better after a cry, but a good one that actually releases something can feel better. And it made me wonder, you know, what did I store there? What, what's that about? It, does that even exist? Is that even possible? Because I know some people are listening right now saying, well, that's ridiculous. That's not possible. That's, that's just a stupid thought. It's all psychological. I like to m help you keep your mind open just in case. Because imagine if someone out there said, it's all psychological. It has nothing to do with the body. Massage isn't going to take care of your repressed negative emotions. That's ridiculous. Imagine if somebody out, out there believes that yet they were wrong and they carried something around with them 
all their life. Well, I'm a scientist and I just don't believe that's true. I know what's true and what's not true. I, you know, as a skeptic myself, I agree. I know what to believe and what not to believe. Yet, I keep my mind open for the possibility that I could be wrong. And because of that, when something strange comes along, like in my book, uh, The Overwhelmed Brain, I talk about EFT, emotional freedom technique, when you do tapping. That is the hokiest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but I do it sometimes because sometimes it works. And I don't know why the hell it works. I just know sometimes it works. And that makes me realize that as skeptical and critical thinking that I am, that there are just some things that I can't explain. And when it works, who am I to say that I shouldn't do it or you shouldn't do it? Who am I to say that? Who are you to say it to anyone else? You shouldn't believe in energy healing. You shouldn't believe in this. You shouldn't believe in crystals. Again, a lot of this stuff is, I hate to say, hokey to me, yet I keep it within the realm of reach so that I don't close my mind to something that I don't understand or that I don't believe for the possibility that if it does work, who cares if it's true or not? Who cares if it's scientifically explainable or not? I don't care. If somebody comes along and says, hey, I do energy work, I don't even have to touch your body, and they get rid of my headache, I don't care how it works. I don't care about the scientific explanation. I'm just glad I don't have a headache anymore. I look at the outcome. I look at results. Yeah, but Paul, you could have cancer of the brain and your headache could be gone. So that energy stuff can't work. Well, if it doesn't work, why is my headache gone? Well, it's psychosomatic. Your thinking is causing your headache. Okay, let's just say that's true. Let's just say that all these hokey modalities that are out there are all doing something to your mind to heal yourself. For example, if somebody puts their hand close to your forehead and your headache goes away, uh, because you believe it enough, your headache goes away. Let's just say that was the reason, which you know I tend to actually side with. <laughs> I tend to actually side with that's the reason. If that's the reason, who cares how we get there? Who cares if somebody puts their hand up to your forehead and your headache goes away if it caused you to have a different thought about it because your belief was so strong that it uh, fired chemicals in your mind and body to help you get rid of the headache? Who cares because it worked? So this is only with what I would consider safer modalities out there. I wouldn't say that someone who wasn't a qualified doctor who injects you with something would be one of the safer modalities out there. And I certainly wouldn't say that you shouldn't be professionally diagnosed, you know, with a lot of things in life. But I am here to say with what I'm talking about today with phobia, I don't know even how this came up, but the idea that I could perhaps see someone that might be able to help me with my phobia that doesn't involve an injection or pills or the traditional medical route, I would be open to it. It's not my first go-to, but I usually would be open to it. And again, I share these things with you just to keep an open mind, not to set you down a certain path, not to set you against certain religious values or beliefs, not to do any of that. I always want you to do what you're most comfortable doing, but also be open to the idea that something else may come along and help. And it comes back to that early episode I talked about in the patron program where I talk about my phobia and I did try the EFT tapping and about 90% of it went away. But I still have about 10% and that 10% is what I'm dealing with now. In fact, it's probably amplified now that things are coming to a head and I need to deal with them even more. So the first part of this episode is talking about phobias in general. I mean, there are techniques that I know that I've heard can help with phobias, but I've never actually tried them with someone to cure a phobia. But uh, there are people that can do that in um, like NLP techniques. And I am going to try that on myself as well. But this episode, I want to talk about commitment phobia. And I'm not going to do any special techniques. I'm going to do one of those question episodes that help you get to some root of what might be happening so that you can get beyond a commitment phobia, which has a lot to do with um, decision-making 
as well. So if you have any trouble committing to a decision or decision making in general, this would be a good episode for you too. So to wrap this all back up, I wanted to mention phobias because phobias can be one of those debilitating things that we carry around with us that prevent us from doing things that maybe we should do. I mean, there's that word, right? Should. We should do this. But the things that we want to do with our life, the things that maybe we have to do in our life, just like with me and the medical stuff. But what if you had a phobia to breathing? I'm afraid to breathe because there's so many nasty pollutants in the air. You kind of want to get that resolved because that's not going to be something you want to carry around with you because every breath involves a fear and you don't want that. So I am all about addressing your phobias, really tackling them. Uh, One of the things that I'm doing about my phobia is reading as much as possible and talking to people about it and getting all the literature I can on it and finding other people that have gone through what I fear going through. All of these resources so that I have all the data so that my phobia doesn't only consist of a few fears that I've created. Because some fears are justified. Some of your phobic fears are justified. There are spiders that bite. There are spiders that can be more deadly than others. And there are a ton of spiders that don't care about you, don't care about biting you, and just want to get away from you. So uh, that's how I got over my fear of spiders, actually, is that 99% of them don't want anything to do with you. They're not chasing you. They just want to be left alone. Yet a lot of us see them and have this reaction, and we want to get away from them, or we want to hurt them, or like me, I rescue them and take them out. (laughs) But that's one phobia out of who knows, thousands, millions of phobias that anyone can have. The idea is that if it's affecting your life, let's tackle that. Let's address it. Read as much as you can about it. Even the bad stuff. Sometimes just to expose yourself to all the elements of it. You know, I found myself reading some of the bad stuff about this phobia. It actually got worse. And I'm thinking, oh no, I don't want it to get that bad. Um, Then I read a lot of other good stuff. And reading about the worst stuff possible made my regular phobia less of a problem. So that's why I encourage you to to just read and learn as much as you can about any phobia that you're carrying around uh, so that you aren't only in your own box of what it is. Because that box is very centered around only fear and not education. Education is not key, but it's a big part of it, a big component of getting past it. So when we come back, I'm going to read you an email regarding uh, commitment phobia, and then I'm going to ask you questions that will help break it down in you so that maybe you can start the process of healing from it if you're dealing with it yourself. Again, it's also about uh, decision making and such. So it applies to a lot of people. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm going to read you an email from someone I'm going to call Brian. Brian is the inspiration for this episode, so thanks for writing, Brian. I'm going to read your email now. He says, thank you for your show. It's been highly invaluable to me. I'd really like to hear an episode about commitment to phobia. I've struggled with a feeling of being trapped in almost every relationship I've had and ruined in the last two decades. When I meet a girl, I go all out to win her over. This means saying and doing all the right things as quickly as possible. My mission is to gain her acceptance of me. The problem is once that I have that acceptance, I'm suddenly faced with the reality that this could turn into a real relationship with expectations. The person who I was infatuated with no longer seems perfect. And as they demand more of my time, I start to feel trapped and an overwhelming need to escape ensues. I start to set the terms of the relationship. For example, how often and when we see each other. When my girlfriend starts to notice this change in me, from being a pursuer to becoming a panicker, she usually attempts to call it quits, in which case I'm suddenly thrown back into the original behavior of trying to win her over. If I manage to achieve this, the cycle repeats and I go back to feeling trapped. I went through this when I met my wife many years ago, 
and it was only through her patience that our relationship endured. When she got pregnant, I was thrown into turmoil and depression because suddenly the choice to leave had been taken away from me, and my values dictated that I must now stay because it's the right thing to do by my wife and my unborn child. We got married and now have three children, and I still go through regular bouts of feeling trapped and wanting to escape my life. It's not that I want to be with anyone else, but it's a difficult concept to be with just one person for the rest of my life and expect all my needs to be met by her. She's actually a wonderful wife and mother, caring and thoughtful, yet something inside tells me that she's not enough for me and that I'd be happier on my own. In between these times of turmoil, I'm a happy person, but the increasing frequency of them is becoming mentally exhausting. It would be great if you could do an episode on this, as I know a lot of people, men and women, struggle with the same conflicts. Thanks for all your work. All right, thanks, Brian. Thanks for being the inspiration for this episode. You know, I hone in on one thing that you said that uh, really stuck out, and that is, it's a difficult concept to be with just one person for the rest of my life and expect all my needs to be met by her. So my question to you, is that what you expect someone else to do for you? When you're in a relationship and you expect all your needs to be met by someone else, you're never going to be happy. Every relationship that you create will have this expectation because you expect your needs to get met by someone else. That doesn't mean that you can't have a relationship where your needs are needs are met by someone else. It just means that when you go in expecting someone else to meet your needs, they can never pull through. She will never be able to meet your needs, not all of them. She can meet some needs, sure. You have sexual desire, sure. You have a need for companionship, sure. You have, you know, so on and so on. She can meet those needs, but those are when they happen, you might need them, but they're not consistent. Like, it's nice to have someone to hug, but you don't want to hug all day long. It's nice to have them there to hug when you need them, but you probably don't need consistent 24-hour hugging. If you do, you might need to talk to a professional. And I'm not making fun of that because maybe there are people out there that need that. But if that's the case, then that's a different story. But uh, I think for the most part, what you're talking about is that, you know, if someone else is responsible for meeting my needs, then I feel like there's what? Constant pressure on them that they'll get upset with me and they'll leave. If that's what you're thinking, you're probably right. Because if you do expect someone to meet all your needs, then that's where the pressure can build. And they may not want to be around that kind of pressure. You know, and they may grow distant and they may say, hey, look, I, I can't be around you because you're too needy or you're too clingy or, or you're too smothering, whatever they are going through, uh, it might be too much for them. So that's the only reason I honed in on that. If that di- isn't what you meant, then perhaps think about changing that wording a little bit. If it is what you meant and you do expect her to meet all your needs, then probably the first thing to work on is your expectations. And uh, if you've been listening to this show a while, you probably have heard me talk about going into a relationship, having met your own needs so that you can share life with the person that you're with instead of sharing dependencies with the person that you're with. You don't want to go in and expect all these things to be met Because when they're not there, if they leave on work for a few days, are you at home pining and longing for their love? Are you lonely? Because if you're in that space, then that's way too much pressure on the other person. And what it usually does is it creates a rift. The other person feels that pressure and they get very exhausted about being the source of all your needs, being that source of energy for you. So you got to be careful with that, and uh, you're not asking that in this email, but um, I wanted to address that just in case that was in you, and if it is, listen to some of the episodes I have on building a good relationship, and just look for the word relationship in the search engine at theoverwhelmedbrain.com, and you will find titles with that word in it, and look for titles that you think are along that lines. Now, something else that you said is that uh, something inside me tells me that she's not enough for me and that I'd be happier on my own. 
So I want you to get really clear about what she's not enough of. What is she not enough of? That that tells me that you are not getting enough. Now, what's funny is that you didn't really say that you're getting enough or not. You just said that something tells you that she's not enough for you. So you are not even backing that up with what's not enough. Now, you may have some things. I'm not saying that it's not there. I'm just saying that it's just an interesting wording. When something tells you she's not enough for you, then I think it's important to find out, uh, A, whose voice that is, who is telling you she's not enough. Is that mom? Is that dad? Is that a voice in your head from a long time ago? When did that voice start? Who did it start with? At what age? At what point did you start saying this person may not be enough for me? Was it when you started dating? Is that your mom protecting you from girls? No one will ever be enough for you because you might have to connect some dots here that um, reveal something that you're holding on to. Could be something really old. But if you do know what's not enough, I want you to list on a piece of paper what's not enough. Well, she kisses me four times a day and I need five. Okay, it could be that, you know, could be something what other people might say minor and what other people might say, oh, that's still not enough. So you need to write down what is enough. You need to define what is enough for you so that you know that the commitment that you've made is the right one. Because I have a strong feeling that you can have the perfect person and they still wouldn't be enough. You'd find something else. And because of that, it doesn't matter what criteria they meet, you still feel like they're not enough. Which means it's never about the other person. It's always about, again, your expectations. And where do those expectations come from? And do you really have expectations? It's another question. Do you really have expectations for a good commitment? What are your expectations of a good commitment? Actually, that should be one of the questions I ask next uh, round because I have a list of about 10 questions I'm going to ask anyone with commitment phobia uh, so that they can help dig into it a little bit. But yeah, what, what are your expectations? How do you define those? Where do those definitions come from? That might be a little deeper question, but where did you get these expectations? Why are these expectations in your life? You know, where do these expectations come from? They probably don't come from anything in the recent past, but I have a feeling in the, the distant past, they started coming up. So that's good to understand. And uh, in the next segment, I'm going to ask you the questions. The questions will be important. The questions will help you reveal what's going on underneath. But I'm just making some observations right now uh, and asking you a few questions regarding the email you sent, regarding some of the things that stick out most. Like one of the things that you said is that in between your times of turmoil, you're a happy person, but the increasing frequency of those times of turmoil is uh, mentally exhausting. So what makes you happy? What makes you happy during those times in between the turmoil? Why are you happy then and not always unhappy? Or why aren't you in turmoil all the time? I have a feeling what you're going to say is because, and maybe you don't know this consciously, but I would say that it's because you are present. I would say that it's because you're not thinking about the past or the future. You're thinking about the present moment and you're enjoying what you have today. And I hate to say this and give it all away, but it's probably the solution right there. Being present, enjoying what you have today, seeing what's right in front of you, knowing that they could be with anyone else right now and they've chosen to be with you. That helps you connect with the now. When you connect with the present moment and you're not thinking about the future, you're not thinking about the past, you're just enjoying what you have now because, I always go here in my own mind, tomorrow may not come. So that might develop fear in someone who is always thinking about the future. But let's just say tomorrow didn't come. What do you have today? What can you enjoy today? Let's just get as much as we can out of today. So I know that's the easy way out. Just be in the present moment. But it's a really good answer. <laughs> it's a really good suggestion because the more you practice that, you know, listen to Eckhart Tolle and other teachers out there. They talk about present moment. If you really embrace that, you can enjoy today, every day, 
you can be in between the turmoil and have it never come if you just do that today every day and what i mean by that is you know you said you are happy in between the turmoil well let's just say that tomorrow is also in between the turmoil and how about the third day and the fourth day and you keep doing that because something exists while you're happy that doesn't exist while you're in turmoil that'll be one of the questions what exists while you're happy what exists while you're in turmoil what exists then it's another good question so these are great things to ask yourself and um, also to remember that uh, this probably has to do with some other dysfunctions that I'm going to talk about uh, that have nothing to do with commitment overall I mean yes they're connected to commitment but the other dysfunctions that um, we have developed as children that we can bring into our adult life that can cause havoc like this uh, one of them is commitment phobia uh, but if we address these other dysfunctions commitments become a lot easier so I'm going to take a break and when we come back I'm going to ask you this series of questions that maybe will help break apart this commitment phobia and I'm also going to share some action steps that you can take to start feeling better about your decisions and feeling better about commitments and uh, hopefully get you into a new space with all of that. So thank you for writing, Brian. Keep listening. We'll be right back and we're going to talk about this some more. Here we are, segment three, the question segment. These are the questions that I created for anyone that has a decision-making or commitment phobia. And these questions are also an addendum worksheet in the patron program. So if you're in the patron program at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com, you can go to the books and workbooks section and uh, find this addendum so you don't have to write these down. And there may be a few extra questions on there as well. But uh, for this segment, anyone listening, you can either do these in your head or write them down. And as always, pause at any time if you need to really think these things through, which I highly recommend. If you're getting an answer, if you're processing something, definitely pause so you can you know, take the time to process it. So for this exercise, I want you to think about something that you have trouble committing to or trouble making a decision on. For example, I used to have trouble making a decision of getting work because I would scroll through all these jobs on the computer and I would have trouble making a call. I did not want to make the call because if I made the call, that might mean I got the job. If I got the job and I didn't like it, that might mean I'm stuck there. And if I'm stuck there, then I will be unhappy and I'll feel like I have no choice but to continue working. So therefore, I won't even make the call. That was a phobic response to something that kept me held back, that kept me from doing what I needed to do to support myself and at the time support my wife. So I want you to think of something that you might have trouble committing to or deciding on. And I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Number one is, what will you lose if you commit to this? Again, pause any time, but I'm just going to keep going unless I want to make a comment on one of these things. But uh, the first question, what will you lose if you commit to this? That's good to know. That's a good thing to think about. What will I lose? Because our fear is usually based on what we'll lose. Well, if I get this job, I'll lose uh, you know, the ability to work somewhere else. That's a weak one, actually. <laughs> but it could be, I'll lose my freedom, or I'll lose, I don't know, my happiness. There's something there that we think we'll lose. Number two is sort of similar, but it is worded in a different way. What stops you from committing to this? What stops you from committing to this? It's good to know. It's good to solidify what's stopping you instead of just saying, I'm scared. I want to know specifically what stops you. What stops you? Well, I did commit to it. Now I'm in it and I'm afraid to be in it forever. Okay. Uh, this question may not apply to that, but that's okay. Just keep listening and one or more of these questions will apply. Number three is, 
what needs to exist in this situation so that I could absolutely commit to it 100%. Now this is challenging you a little bit. You really need to think about what needs to exist in the situation so that you could absolutely commit to it 100%. That means you'd have no qualms about it. Well, you know, the, the job would have to pay me $100,000 a year and I would have to have weekends off and I would have to have a nice boss and I should be able to have, make my own schedule. I mean, you might have very stringent criteria. But what is that criteria? Put it down, even if it's a little crazy. What needs to exist in this situation or relationship or whatever you're committing to so that I could absolutely commit to it 100%? Okay, number four is thinking back to number one about what you'd lose by committing to this. If you had no choice but to accept that loss and you knew you'd never be able to get back what you lost, no matter what, would that be something you could live with? You may not like it, it may sound awful, but would it be something that you could live with? That might take some thought, so pause if you need to. Number five is, if you had a week to live, would you be able to commit then? In other words, does the amount of time that you have left to live factor in to your fear of commitment? I think that's an important one. If you had a week left to live, would you be able to commit then? Because often what we'll do is think about all this time that we have available to us, which can sometimes be a fallacy. If we think we have all this time, we have all these years to choose something else, then we think we're committing for that period of time and that anything else could come along. And what if I'm wrong and I could you know, select that other thing? Well, what if you had a week to live and that time is gone? How does that change the way you commit? How does that change your fear? Does it change your fear? Does it transform anything inside of you? Good question. Number six, what would make you happier overall? A lifetime of short, unfulfilling situations that you feared committing to, or a long, happy commitment that you could choose to end at any time? Think about that. Do you want a lifetime of short, unfulfilling situations that you feared committing to? Meaning, uh, just like Brian, he's starting to get into a relationship and finally they have somewhat of a relationship, but now he realizes, oh no, we're committed. I better break this off or she's going to leave me anyway. It might have been fun for a while, but now it's unfulfilling because it's breaking apart. And um, how many of those do you want in your life as opposed to one long, happy commitment that you could choose to end at any time? See, that last part commitment phobes don't necessarily add. They don't add the I could choose to end this at any time factor. Now Brian chose not to add it because he said I have kids. Now that I have kids I am fully committed. I'm married and I have kids so I can't end this at any time. You know what that does when you add that um, I don't know what to call it dequalifier. You, you, you add something that forces you to be in a situation taking out all choice. When you take out all choice, when you take out all options and you feel stuck, then it is very difficult to enjoy. This is why I encourage you to always believe you have a choice. Yes, there are commitments. Yes, there are promises that we make to people and we want to stay with them and keep our promises and raise our kids as a family. There's a lot of involvement there. And it would be great if you could keep your promises and be happy and you know, go throughout life as this person that doesn't mind having made all these commitments. But I tell you what happened to me when I started realizing that I had a choice. I chose to be in relationships and commit fully to them and fear like crazy that the relationship would end. I stayed in these relationships with this fear, this devastating fear that the relationship could end. And when they left for a few days on business or whatever, travel, I would have this loneliness. I would have this pining, this longing, this desire to be with them so badly and I would miss them and I would text them. I don't think I was texting back then uh, in the 90s. I would phone them and want to connect with them in some way. I was just so little without them. I just felt so 
so unfulfilled without them. And being in that way was very exhausting. It was hard to stay that way when I couldn't be with them, so I felt so unfulfilled, so I always wanted to connect with them. So those relationships ended. Because when you are highly dependent on someone else to fulfill your needs, they're going to feel the pressure and they're going to want to separate. You know, often they're going to want to separate. They're going to want to create a rift between you so that they don't feel like you're, and I hate to say it this way, leeching off of them, leeching that energy. Please make me happy. Please give me the companionship I need because I can't do it alone. All of that is me take. I want to take from you. I want to take from you. I want to take from you. And often what will happen is that the person who's always wanting that from them thinks that the other person should be giving it to them. And we put that burden on someone else. It's not, I mean, yes, in relationships we should give equally and that is how it should go. I believe that's how it should go. It should be an equal giving. But when it feels like the person has to give a lot more then you give to them, then it creates an imbalance and it creates a rift. In my past, in my relationships, that's how it was. There was this imbalance. I would want more than they could give. That rift would form and then we'd separate and it would be over. When I started fulfilling my own needs and realizing that I needed to take care of whatever was going on inside of me, if I had a low sense of self-worth, if I had a low sense of feeling loved, if I had a fear of abandonment and rejection, I had to address all of this stuff. I had to work through it so that I didn't bring those high desire to fulfill those needs into our relationship. As soon as I took care of those, then the other person did not feel like they were under pressure to do it for me. And that took care of a lot of stuff. But healing from a lot of that stuff also allowed me to bring in the choice to not be in the relationship too. I never had that choice before. I never gave that choice to me. To bring in the choice that I could end this relationship at any time. I mean, it's not something I would say to them, but it's just a choice that I allow myself to have because it shows that I love myself. That if something changes in the relationship, that I have the option to do it. Just like if I got a job that I didn't like, I felt so committed to it before because I'm that loyal person, but I could change it at any time. I could quit at any time because I have that option. It's not that I would. It's just giving myself the choice to do it. When I get into a relationship now, I am committed. I am absolutely here 100% on, unless they either kick me out or there's something that's such a violation of my boundary or values that I need to reconsider. But I always have that choice. I always give myself that choice. Yes, even when there are other commitments. And again, it's not that you act on it. It's that you tell yourself that you have it. And that creates the difference. And I tell you what, when you're on a job, for example, and you know that you could quit any time, you're more likely going to enjoy the job. That's just how it works because you know you could leave at any time. And that also tends to make you be more expressive and say what's on your mind. It tends to for some people. For me, it did. For me, I started not caring if I got fired or not. And suddenly I was speaking my mind. I wasn't being a jerk. I was just being honest, speaking my mind. And they appreciated it more. And I realized, oh, I can actually be myself in this job and still have the option to leave if I ever wanted to. And it usually allowed me to stay longer. It made me stay longer because I felt good being there, being myself. You know, a lot of commitment phobia has to do with the fear of being yourself. We're going to get into that in a moment. I'm still on the questions. <laughs> so let's get through the rest of these. Number seven is, once I commit to this thing I fear, what would make it worse? What would make it even worse than that? This is where we take that fear to the limit. We go to the worst case scenario. We want to discover what's driving the fear at the deepest level. So once you commit to this thing, what would make it worse? Well, if I got this job, what would make it worse is a really evil boss. Okay, what would make it worse than that? Oh my God, what if they wanted me to work outside in the hot sun on do tar on some roof? You know, what would make it worse for you and whatever you're committing to? 
Just keep going down that worst case scenario. What would make it worse than that? And worse than that. Number eight. This is going to rub you maybe the wrong way. <laughs> but hear me out. It has purpose. What makes you so special to think that you could have anything else? Now, I ask this question not because I believe that you're not special, but I want you to consider it to find out where you go with it. What makes you think you're so special that you could have anything else? Just like if I got into a relationship with a girl and, oh, I'm so scared of committing to this girl because what if something better comes along? Well, what makes me so special to think that I could have anything else? This is more humbling than anything. This is something that it's important to make sure that your ego is not running away with this and making you think that you're all that. <laughs> this is the anti-personal growth question. Because you are all that. You are special. You are amazing. Yet, what makes you think you're so special? The point is, if that is an issue for you, that you do think maybe that you're entitled to other things, to better things, to something else that may come along, this just keeps you in check. This is not meant to hurt your feelings. This is not meant to make you feel less or diminished in any way. This is uh, to make sure that you're not overvaluing yourself because you can put yourself on a pedestal so high that you believe the world is yours to take which can be helpful in some circumstances and business and things like that. Uh, but when you do that, where it becomes a detriment to yourself, where, oh, well, I can have anything I want, so why would I want that? Because something else could come along. Well, if that comes along, well, why would I want that? Because something else could come along. And sometimes it's helpful to humble yourself and say, you know what, I'm not all that. <laughs> I'm not that great. Uh, I'm going to get this and I'm going to be happy with it because what if something else comes along? And it turns out that they are, that's just a nightmare because the thing that I want to come along may never come along because why would they look at me? <laughs> Not to put yourself in that low place, but it's just a humbling exercise. All right, let's get to the next one. We'll get past this one. Number nine is when was the first time that you felt trapped or locked into a decision that you couldn't change? What was going on in your life then? Another way to word that is, when is your earliest memory of feeling like you couldn't get out of a situation and had no choice but to stay in it? What was the earliest memory of that? Because if you felt trapped or locked into a decision that you couldn't change, it's going to affect your whole life because you're going to think, I better not get trapped ever again. But usually that time that you feel trapped, it taints the rest of our life. And it doesn't always mean it's going to be that way forever. It's just that first decision we've generalized over other decisions and other commitments so that we don't make the decisions and commitments that we probably need to make to be satisfied because we think it's going to happen just like that. For example, when I was a kid, I didn't think I had a choice but to stay in this you know, abusive upbringing with my alcoholic stepfather. And I probably didn't. I felt really locked in. There was nothing I could do. When he got upset, uh, where could I go? I could probably just go outside, but I had to come back. So I, I felt locked in. And that feeling of locked in certainly played a role uh, in my life elsewhere. But it's helpful to connect those dots to the past and figure out you know, where did this originate. You may not know, and you don't have to know any of these answers. It's just uh, these are things to jostle the brain and start getting things uh, moving around in there to hopefully get to a better place. That was number nine. Let's go to number 10 and 11. And these are Brian's specific questions. They can be helpful to anyone listening. But the person, Brian, who wrote that email, uh, you said that in between your moments of turmoil, you are happy. So that's in you, which is excellent. And um, you've probably heard me ask this question before, but what's present when you're happy that's missing when you're in turmoil? And anyone who's done NLP, you've probably heard this question, but it's a great, great question. I use it all the time for uh, a lot of stuff in my own life. What's present when you're happy that's missing when you're in turmoil? Think about that. 
Because when you're done thinking about that, I want you to answer the next one. This one's a little bit more challenging, a little bit more twist on the brain. What's missing when you're happy that's present when you're in turmoil? Wrap your brain around that one and do some processing. What's missing when you're happy that's present when you're in turmoil? What's missing when I'm happy? (laughs) You got to come up with something there. There's no right or wrong answer. These are just questions to think about. There are probably some more, like I said, that I'll include in the addendum worksheet in the patron program. If you want to see these worksheets as I release them, go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com and uh, join as a supporting member and you'll have access to that. Um, Otherwise, as always, you can write these down and um, go through them yourself and uh, see where you can get with them. These are important for anyone that has any trouble making decisions or especially commitments. Rewind, replay, go over these again, and hopefully you'll get into a new space. When we come back, I'm going to say some thank yous and some final words on commitment phobia. Be right back after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank Asha with GetOutOfTheMess.com. If you want answers to your legal question, you might want to get Legal Shield. Asha is an independent associate for Legal Shield, and she can help you connect with a service that will help you answer all your legal questions and even get you discounts on legal services. So it's definitely worth it. Call her at 678-355-8777. She's not there to hype it up for you. She's just there to answer your questions to find out if it's right for you. So give her a call, 678-355-8777. And I want to thank the newest members of the patron program, Ron and Jasmine and others that have joined. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for supporting the show. I mean, that really means a lot to me. Uh, I know you're not only supporting the show. You're also getting all the private episodes and private workbooks and worksheets along with the addendum worksheets that uh, I create for some of the episodes. And uh, some of the older episodes are coming out with worksheets too. So if you've been listening a while and you haven't seen those, I just started creating these, so I'm going to kind of catch up on some of the ones I missed. Uh, But they can be helpful to have the worksheets in front of you so you can go through the questions and have them laid out in a way that's uh, more organized and easy to uh, digest. But if you're interested in joining the patron program, go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com and check it out. And to all existing patron members, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. You are much of the backbone of this show, and you are valuable to me. And I want to tell you about the mean workbook over at loveandabuse.com. You know, if you're in one of those relationships that you've committed to, and now you've invested in the relationship and you realize, oh crap, what did I get myself into? You know, is this relationship the right one for me? This feels like it's toxic, but I can't really tell why it's toxic. Or if you know why it's toxic, but you really can't pinpoint the behavior, you know, you might be experiencing some form of emotional abuse or manipulation. That's what the Mean Workbook helps you assess. It's got a 200-point assessment to really go over in very specific bullet points exactly what your relationship might be experiencing and how to define it for you because I don't want you to pull your hair out I want you to be able to know what's going on so that you have something to work with so that you know what next steps to take because sometimes we think oh we're committed that's it Uh, I'm going to be stuck like this forever and I'll just be miserable for the rest of my life I never want that for you. I never want that to happen. This life isn't meant to be miserable all the whole time. We're going to have miserable moments, but it, it certainly has its ups and downs. But it should have an equal amount, if not more ups than downs, especially in a relationship. If you are having so many more downs than ups, then you need to find out why. Go to loveandabuse.com and see if the mean workbook will help you. And finally, I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. So one of the action steps I want you to take, uh, if you're a commitment phobe, if you are a decision-making phobe, if you can't trust your own decisions, I mean, that's one of the signs of an emotionally abusive relationship. And you don't even have to be in one today. You could have been in one as a child in an emotionally abusive relationship or 
a relationship with a narcissistic parent or a parent that didn't know any better and was just teaching you what they learned. And, you know, I don't blame people. I just know that hurt people hurt people. And we tend to carry on and pass on things that we learned, that we were conditioned to do, that behavior that we picked up, survival mechanisms, coping mechanisms, all of these uh, personality characteristics that we have usually came from someone else or in some way through someone else. So it's not like I just want to blame your parents and blame your childhood. I never want to do that. But often we get what's passed down to us and it transforms throughout the generations. It morphs, it mutates, and it turns into something unique for us. So this is why I look at any type of relationship that has any toxic elements and what did that do to us? The toxic elements in the relationships that you've had in your past might have created a situation where you can't trust your decisions today. You can't trust your ability to uh, go into a committed relationship or make a commitment to a certain uh, situation where you now feel like you're stuck, where you feel like, gee, you know, if this isn't the best I can get, then am I going to just love the one I'm with? You know, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. I never liked that song. <laughs> Only because of what it said. But at the same time, I understand its sentiment. You know, you think you love this person so much and you want to, you want to be with that person. Uh, but this other person comes along and they have all these amazing qualities. Why aren't you loving this person? And then you realize, well, that person's unreachable and this person's right in front of me. I'm going to love the one I'm with. And then suddenly you are with the one you love. I understand that sentiment, but I always took it the wrong way. <laughs> I always took it as if you can't be with the one you really love, well, just settle for this guy or this girl. <laughs> so I think I'm wrong about that. Well, I think I'm right in the, the former, what I was just explaining, but in the latter about settling, I think I'm wrong about that. Uh, who knows? I should look up the meaning of the song. I'm, I could be wrong on all levels. But anyway, the um, idea of making decisions and making a commitment isn't about settling. It's not about settling. It's about trusting your decision until it's proven otherwise. Now, let me explain that a little bit. Let's just, I saw this episode of Sliders a long time ago. It's an old sci-fi show where this group of people uh, slid into parallel universes all the time. For those who have heard this and watched it, they're going, oh my God, I love that show. <laughs> that was me. I loved that show. Uh, but I remember the main character slid into a universe where he found an alternate version of himself. And the main character said, hey, you know, I'm going to tell you something. You may not believe it. And he's telling this alternate version of himself that they slide between parallel universes. And the other guy in the parallel universe says, all right, that makes sense. Let's go take care of this um, thing that we got to take care of. And the main character is like, what? You, you believe me just by telling you this? And he said, I believe you until you give me a reason not to. And I thought that was an amazing line. That, just line, that line stuck with me forever. And it really helped me create a philosophy of believing someone until they give me a reason not to. I mean, what that does is give me the freedom to have more belief and more trust in people, but also this is the best part, give me the choice to stop believing them when something comes along that changes my perception. I think that's important, is to give yourself that choice to change your perception. And when you change your perception, give yourself the choice to not trust anymore. To, not forever, but just not trust that person or whatever's going on. You give yourself the choice. This is that whole idea of eliminating resistance. I have resistance when I don't trust someone, but I don't have resistance when I trust them. So I choose to trust them until they give me a reason not to trust them. And now I have resistance trusting them, but I have valid resistance. A lot of the time we have invalid resistance because we have no reference for it. It's like meeting someone that um, you have a preconceived notion of, like a big biker with a leather jacket on and He's got the do-rag on his head, and you might have a preconceived notion about someone who dresses like that. You might have fear, or you might think they're not smart, or not wealthy, or, you know, you, have, you might have all these preconceived notions. So you develop a bias, and you approach them cautiously, and you now carry around this resistance toward them. 
and they did nothing wrong, unless you have a reference. If you have a reference of a biker gang attacking you, that might give you a reference. But you know, often we create these biases, probably from media, probably from other people that we've talked to, when we've never actually talked to, for example, the person that we have a bias toward. And so we create this bias, which creates this resistance that we walk around with. And as long as we believe a portion of that, then we can never have the experience that we could have if we had just opened up a little bit and created less resistance. And my point about saying that is you can have more trust about what's before you and give yourself the choice not to trust if there's something that causes that and not just something pretend that we're making up or something that we heard from other people and all bikers are like that, for example. If you can give yourself both options, then you are free to observe and go forward without too much fear. It's usually what happens is the less choice we think we have, the more fear that kicks in. Just like the phobia I was talking about. The less choice I think I have about this phobia usually means the less educated I am. And um, the more fear that develops because I think that I'll never have a choice and I must only do something a certain way and it will always be something I fear because I only have this certain box of understanding about it. And just like that guy said in the TV show, I trust until you give me a reason not to trust. That opens up both paths. It takes out the resistance and says, you know, it's easier to trust. And until you give me a reason not to trust, hey, now you did something and I don't trust you. Now I've, I'm still on the most empowering path because I have more information. I have a reference that I can use as information to help me go forward. So coming back to making decisions and making commitments, when you are able to eliminate the resistance that you have regarding your commitment, regarding the decision, that's when it's easier to make the decision. For example, if you have a resistance toward committing to someone because you feel like something better may come along, why don't you go into the relationship uh, committing to them, you know, you're all in it, and giving yourself the ability to say, well, if something better comes along, then I'll get that. Now, before you go sending me your letters, <laughs> let me explain that. It doesn't mean that's what you're going to end up doing. It just means you give yourself the option to do it. Having options is freedom for your brain. It liberates your brain. If I told you, hey, this is the person you're going to marry. And no matter what happens, if he or she turns into the devil <laughs> and they become a nightmare for you, it doesn't matter. You're stuck because you're committed. If I said that to you, you're never going to want to get married. You're never going to want to be with that person. You're never, you may never want to commit to anyone. But if I said to you, this is the person you're going to marry. And no matter what, no matter what happens, you have the choice to leave at any time. You have the choice. Even if you have kids, even if you have commitments, even if you have a mortgage together, you have the choice to leave anytime you want. What does that do for you? To me, it frees me. It opens me up. Yeah, but Paul, you should commit. You know, people are going to say that you should commit. Once you're committed, you promise God. <laughs> I, I hear that too. You promised God that you would commit to this person. Well, as soon as you do that, as soon as you lock yourself into, I promise and I will never break that promise, what do you carry with you? If you carry good feelings, that's fine. I'm not telling you to change that. But if you carry any sense of fear, resistance, uh, any sense of having no more options, which makes you feel restricted, then I say what you do is give yourself permission to know that you can change things at any time. Doesn't mean you have to. Doesn't mean you will. What ends up happening is that when you're in a relationship, for example, that you feel you committed to and you have the option at any time to leave, just because you have that option doesn't mean you will, but what it does is it frees you to be yourself. This is what it's all about, as far as I can tell, with commitments is that we fear getting into commitments because we fear being our truly genuine, authentic self. I feared committing to jobs at one point in my life 
because if I got the job and then my boss turned out to be a jerk, now I'm stuck. I mean, that was my thought process. That was the sequential order of thought. Instead of, if I got the job and my boss turned out to be a jerk, I'm just going to say, hey, boss, you're being a jerk. You're disrespecting me. My thoughts never went there. But now they do because I had to learn personal boundaries. I was telling you some of the dysfunctions that create commitment phobia. One of them, personal boundaries. If your boundaries are being violated and you don't stand up for yourself, no wonder you have commitment phobia because someone's violating your boundaries and you're not standing up for yourself. Your commitment phobia is often related to something that you don't want to do for yourself. Oh, they're violating one of my values. I disagree with that. I better shut up because I'm committed. That can be where some people go. Instead of saying, whoa, what you're doing is a real violation of my values. I know you don't use these words, <laughs> but you say something along the lines of like, what? You're doing that? That? I can't have that in my life. That's a violation of my values. I don't accept that in my life. Let's talk about this. Is there a compromise? Can we talk about this and reach an agreement where you can value my values, I can value your values, or at least reach a compromise where we can understand each other's values enough so that we don't hurt one another. And this kind of honest conversation can take place when you realize, hey, I can leave this relationship anytime. It can take place a lot easier because when you don't have a fear of losing something, you are more likely to be yourself. This is what it's all about, is when you fear committing, it's usually because you fear being yourself. It's usually because you fear saying something that's truly on your mind. Oh man, this person started uh, drinking heavily at night and I don't like it. Now I feel stuck. I'm stuck with this, whatever you want to call them, drunk alcoholic. I don't want to deal with this. I, you know, I, I, I didn't sign up for this. That's when you speak up saying, hey, look. I don't like you drinking every night. This is not what I signed up for. This is not what I want in my life. When you have no fear of the loss of losing the relationship, you can talk like this. Hey, look, I don't want this. You're going to have to stop or whatever. I mean, that may not be what you say, but uh, you could certainly say, let's go get you help or can you stop this because it's a problem. You have these conversations. Sometimes they're very hard, but now you empower them with the ability to make their case and defend themselves or talk with you in a normal conversation like oh i didn't realize that affected you i didn't realize that i didn't realize this okay i'll stop drinking i don't really need it and that could be the way the conversation goes or it may not it may go the total opposite direction what you can't tell me what to do i'm an adult i can do anything i want with my body they may say something like that and then you have a choice to make well you know i don't want to be with someone like that and you may suggest counseling you may suggest something further um, that will help the relationship but it all comes from the option of being able to stay or go. Having that option frees you to be yourself, frees you to be genuine. And when you're genuine, you have real conversations that lead to real results. And yes, you may end up having to leave the situation. It's usually the final straw, the last thing you've tried. You exhausted everything, so maybe you have to do that. That's not the reason you give yourself the choice, though, the option to leave. That's not the reason. You give yourself the option to leave so that it doesn't prevent you from being yourself. I hope I've said that in many ways to make it make sense. One final thing on commitment phobia and decision phobia is uh, something I've said in one of my episodes on making decisions, and it has to do with, in order to start working through this, I want you to start making small decisions and sticking to them. And what I mean by that is if you're looking at a menu at a restaurant and you find something that you like, stop looking. <laughs> I see my girlfriend do this all the time. She finds something that she likes. Oh, I really like that. And then she'll keep looking and she'll look for something else that might be better. And then she'll look and she'll look and she takes a while and she finally finds, oh, I like this too. Oh, I like this too. And then suddenly she's in indecision and non-commitment. And when the waiter comes around, She'll say, okay, uh, uh, get everyone else's order but mine. And then she'll sit there going, mm, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I tell her, and it never works. <laughs> not that I'm all-knowing, not that I'm trying to coach her and doing the right thing or anything like that. But I tell her, as soon as you find something you like, close the menu. She goes, yeah, but there's so much more to choose from. 
All right. If indecision and commitment phobia aren't in your life, that's fine. <laughs> you can do anything you want. I'm not going to try to fix you. That's not my purpose here. But if you find it bothers you, if you find, and I'm talking to you now, the listener, if you find that uh, decision making is hard and making commitments is hard, then start making the small decisions easier by making them and sticking to them and not changing them. Because what happens is, yes, you could find something else. Yes, in the restaurant, you could see something ordered, something that you could have gotten. But it doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is you make the decision and you stick to it because what it does is it helps to burn in the brain the decision that you made. That way, if you make the wrong decision, it really makes an impact. It burns in your brain and you're like, I'll never order that Cuban sub again. I'll never do that again. Or when I order it, I got to make sure I add banana peppers because it's so plain. You know, you're going to make these decisions uh, more concrete instead of continuing to search for the, the best choice. You make them faster. You make them because that's what you liked first and you don't go further. There's always going to be something. This is the thing. There's always going to be something better. There is. There's always going to be something better that you'll like more. Always. So find something you like, stick to it, and then make the decision, go for it. And just do this with the small stuff. If it's between two movies, make the decision, go to that movie, and whether you like it or not, you'll figure it out, and then you'll have the ability to make decisions faster next time. All right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go down this road instead of that road this time. Yeah, but that road might take a long time. I've already made my decision. This is what I'm doing. I practiced this and I failed many times, <laughs> but it helps me get very clear in committing and making decisions and feeling good about my decisions because that's the ultimate goal is to feel good about the decision that you made because as you do this more and more, you start to shape what you like and what you don't like in a way that you can make decisions faster about those things. That way, when you're at when you're looking at the menu and you see that Cuban sub again, you can go boom right past it. You know, I'm not going to get that. I'm not going to get that. I don't even need that. And how fast can you do that? It doesn't mean you can't ever change your mind. It just means that to practice this, to make yourself not so fearful of making decisions, you start small, you make the decisions, whether they're right or wrong, so that you can move forward to the next decision and the next decision. And eventually anything that you quote failed at will become a lesson learned so that you can make the next decision even better and even faster. I've done this. It works. You just have to practice it. And let me end by saying this. We talked about giving yourself the ability to have choice, to have the options, to want to leave a situation or stay in the situation. When you take away that ability to choose, you add resistance to your life. And resistance makes you believe that you are being forced to decide. And no one likes to make a decision that they feel like they're being forced to make. So at a deep level, you may think you're being forced to make decisions, even though they're your decisions. That's why I say, add the choice that you can stay or go at any time. And that helps you eliminate or at least diminish the resistance around making decisions and making commitments. And as always, when it comes to decision making, Keep an open mind so that you can step into your power. This will help you be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you. You are amazing. Amazing.